Forest Hill family, it's great to be with you today on this beautiful day, another glorious day that God has made for us to hear from Him and His Word. That's what we're going to do today as you're joining us for day number 414 of our walk through the Word with Jesus, one chapter per day. And we have a couple of Psalms before us this morning. I am uh, not going to be walking through Mark with you. We're, we're looking at Psalm 60 and 61 for today. And so the good news is it's going to be a bit more brief than usual. So you can thank the Lord for that because we have uh, less text um, to, to read, to meditate on, and a different style of text altogether uh, being in the Psalms. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we approach uh, these two Psalms asking for his blessing. Please pray with me. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have as your people uh, to hear from you, Lord. Thank you that you have given us Psalms 60 and 61 for our edification as your people, for instruction, as we'll find, Lord, and for uh, growing us in faith in you. Uh, the same God who gave David uh, these verses to author is the God who is revealing them to your people even now. We thank you and you that you are the same God that is hearing this prayer. Uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you for being so kind to us as your people. Uh, we pray we would be girded up for service, that we would be uh, encouraged uh, and ready for whatever you would have us to do today and into the future, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're looking at Psalm 60 and we'll read both, uh, one after another. Now, one thing that you'll note is I am going to read the superscript there because not only does it help to give us some context as to uh, the context of this, uh, the, the authoring of this psalm, but it also is God's Word. Those uh, titles there, not the ones in italics if you're reading from an ESV, for instance, but the, uh, but the actual uh, regular print text is part of God's Word. So let's read Let's read those as we read Psalm 60 and 61. Psalm 60, to the choir master, according to Shushan Edith, a mictum of David, for instruction, when he strove with Aram Naaram and with Aram Zobah, and when Joab on his return struck down 12,000 of Edom in the Valley of Salt. O God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry. O restore us. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches, for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow, Selah. That your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. God has spoken in his holiness. With exultation I will divide up Shechem and portion out the vale of Succoth. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. O grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. Psalm 61, to the choir master with stringed instruments of David. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings, Selah. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. Well, these psalms are both written by David, but they're somewhat different in terms of their content. Uh, psalm 60 
is, as the superscript there tells us, uh, for instruction. It's for the purpose of instructing God's people. And David was writing this in a time, as as that title also says, uh, when he strove with Aram Nearam and with Aram Zoba. Now, this refers to 2 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, we haven't gotten there in our daily devotionals yet. We're still uh, just kind of getting into 2 Samuel at the moment. Uh, but we are seeing uh, in this morning's passage a reference back to 2 Samuel 8, which we'll come to, in which God gives victory to David. Uh, it's actually just, just on the heels of 2 Samuel 7 when God covenants with David uh, to make him uh, in the line of Abraham, uh, one of his uh, people, the, the king uh, who would have an heir for his throne, who would be victorious over, over everyone, really, the true king over all creation, over everything, Jesus. We see the foreshadowing of Jesus in that in 2 Samuel 7, but then we see immediately thereafter victory. We see victories, many victories that God gives to David uh, right right after this promise that he makes to him. And so what we see in that is God ensuring that he's, his promises will be fulfilled. And David is kind of a, he's a type of the true king that will come from his line in the future. And God is foreshadowing that by giving David victories. And one of those victories is over the people of Edom in the Valley of Salt. Now, this morning's passage mentions 12,000 men that David struck down. Uh, there's even more mention in the 2 Samuel 8 passage, um, but uh, it's focusing in on this segment of the battle where David was apparently thinking something along the lines of what we see in today's psalm. Uh, we see kind of a an interesting balance because the psalm starts in the first few verses talking about... Uh, God kind of not really seeming to be with his people as they're maybe going to war or as they're just going through life. Uh, and then again, at the end, it seems to kind of be somewhat similar. Have you not, verse 10, have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. So it it's a very honest, very real uh, response that David perhaps had uh, on that day when he strove with Aram Nearam and with Aram Zobah. Uh, with these with these Edomite armies. And yet in the middle, what I find so refreshing and what I think we're meant to see as sort of the control of this passage, we see in verses 6 to 8, God speaking, or at least David referencing truths that God had communicated. God has spoken in his holiness. With exultation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the veil of Succoth. So this is the land that God was going to give to his people. It was called Shechem, or at least that was one of the principal cities way back uh, in, in the time when it was just Canaan before, uh, when, when God had called Abram and Abram's family was just kind of coming into that land. Uh, Shechem was an important city then. And God is saying, I will, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the Vale of Succoth. He, he's going to give this land to his people, who we then see in verses 7. Uh, actually, those three lines in verse 7 are all referencing God's people. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. These are uh, tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, representing the, the majority of Israel. Uh, and then Judah is my scepter. That's a reference back to Genesis 49 when God, through Jacob, prophesied that Judah would be the tribe that would be the scepter from whom the king would come, David's line. And David is stating that. He's, he's recalling that as, as he's stating verse 7. And he's then, as a result, saying, Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. And so what we're seeing there is God, uh, because he is for his people, because he is for Israel, Manasseh, Ephraim, Gilead, Judah, uh, he is against the foes, the enemies of his people, Moab, Edom, Philistia. 
And that's at the heart of the passage. It's, it's meant to be the, the control. It's meant to guide our thinking. But what's so unique about Psalm 60 and helpful for us as Christians is that it's not, it's, it's helping us see that Christian living isn't this rosy experience that we might sometimes think it should be. It's hard. There's ups and downs, or there's downs and then ups and then downs and then ups again. Because as we said, it seems like God is angry, verse 1, with his people. When will you restore us, O Lord? And, and he moves into the middle section where there's truth that he holds on to, David holds on to, about God's will for his people, his plan for his people. He will crush his people's enemies. And then there's this dip again. Who, who will lead me to eat him? Haven't you rejected us, O God? How are we going to, like verse 8, you're going to cast your shoe upon Edom? I don't, how's that going to happen? But then truth again, carrying David through. Grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God we shall do valiantly. Not we might, not we may, not we could, but we shall, we will. It is he who will tread down our foes. Christians, that's true for you. That's true for us as God's people. There is no enemy that God will not defeat in the end. And as our experience of life proceeds, as we continue going through the ups and downs, we have rock solid truth to hold on to. I wonder if there's a verse like David has here, a couple of verses, a couple of truths that God had spoken that he held on to. I wonder if there's one that, that you might hold on to as you go through the trials of life, as you perhaps are mocked for being a Christian as maybe you're, you're shunned or you're just marginalized for believing in Jesus. I mean, a, a man who, who died to save people from sin, whatever that is. You, you may experience that kind of mockery or that kind of, if nothing else, just brushing off socially by people. What verse will you hold on to when you are criticized for your faith in God? Maybe, maybe verse 7 because it's true for you as much as it was true for David in his time. Judah is God's scepter. Manasseh is his. Ephraim is his helmet. Gilead is, is the Lord's. That's us. So let's hold on to that truth. And let's pray for those who persecute us, who, who mock us. Let's be girded up to actually share with them through such truth. And then Psalm 61, just in brief here, uh, it's just a blessing to know that we will dwell in God's tent forever as his people, as we come to him in Jesus. Now, we, we said before that it is Jesus who is the scepter that would come from Judah. And because Jesus is, that was from Psalm 60, right there in the middle, verse 7, because Jesus is the scepter that came from Judah, he is the rock of Psalm 61, verse 2. He's the rock that is higher than us. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, we get that picture of Jesus having been the rock who followed his people in the wilderness way back when, even before David's day. So the idea of Jesus being the rock, uh, the Christ being the rock who would provide water for his people, uh, it's perhaps here in view as well the rock that is higher than I, who will provide for us. It's through him, it's through Jesus, that we can dwell, verse 4, in God's tent forever, where we can be taken, where we can take refuge, we can be taken in under the shelter of Yahweh's wings. And then a prayer, verse 6, prolong the life of the king, may his years endure to all generations. David's not principally speaking of himself there, although he is. He's speaking of this very king, this very rock, uh, this very uh, Jesus who would do what we needed him to do, to be taken in by God, to not be counted as Edom, to not be one of those 12,000 struck down in the Valley of Salt. The only difference between those people and Judah and Ephraim and Manasseh and David himself and us. The only difference between the enemies of God and us is that God had mercy on us. We all were dead in sin. We all deserved to be struck down in that valley of salt. But God called people 
under the banner, where is that? Under the banner, Psalm 60, verse 4, of Christ, his victory over the armies of sin, Satan, and darkness. And that's the reason that we can have hope. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, enabling, asking him to enable us uh, for clarity about the victory that Jesus has provided and the kind of future that we have in store so that we would, as Psalm 61, 8 says, sing praises to his name and perform our vows to him day after day. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Lord, who has come to save a people for himself, for your glory, Lord. You have not only promised that in the scriptures, you have actually made it happen. Jesus has come and has dealt with the greatest enemies that would thwart your plan for your people. Satan is the accuser, ever ready to mock and to criticize and to to say to you, what, what are you doing? What are you doing being generous and kind to these people? They're, they're sinful. They're evil. They're wicked. They've mocked you. But you, O oh Lord, you have provided in such a way to shut Satan's mouth. You have provided for your people through your son, Jesus. May he get the praise from us, from our lips and from our hearts and from our actions today and evermore, Lord. He deserves it. It's in him that we have refuge. We are his he holds the scepter evermore. May we worship him today. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm glad that you can join us for this look at these two psalms this morning. I hope you'll be back with us again tomorrow as we continue reading more about David in the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel. And um, yeah, God bless you, brothers and sisters. Go well. Mm -hmm.